presence of the Lord. Again, welcome to those who are watching this online. We want you to not just watch, but participate. God has something to speak to every one of us. We're going to be entering into a season in September, recognizing that we've been in this building 15 years and the church anniversary of 45 years. So we're going to be taking the month of September, October, talking about our mission, our vision, and what God is saying to us. And of course, in November, the big day on November 10th, my mentor in the Lord, Bishop Mark Sherman, will be with us in person, and we're going to have a big, big, big throwdown on that day. So September begins what we're going to call the months of love. But meanwhile, we've got two weeks before that begins, and there have been some words that have been stirring in my heart that are just kind of words that are not in a series form, but they're words that I believe that are not only, not only important to understand, but there are some prophetic t- undertones of what I believe God is saying to the church. I always like to know that I'm preaching something that is, well, the word of God itself is timeless. You can speak the word that you've preached 10 years ago, you can preach it today and it still is effective. But there's something about hearing what God is saying at this moment, okay? And if you've got your Bible, just one simple verse, 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 42. 1 Kings 20, Verse 42, I'm going to only read one verse because the entire story that we're going to extract some principles from is very long, and we don't have time for that today. So what you can do is my assignment to you is you can go home and you can read the entire chapter of verse t- of chapter 20 of 1 Kings, and uh, I believe you'll get an insight. But I'm going, to, I'm going to summarize it, but let's read this one verse, verse 42. It says, then he said to him, thus says the Lord, this is the prophet speaking to Ahab, because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. I want to talk to you today. Now, you may not get it from there, but if you'll stick with me, I will prove my points many times over and over. I want to talk to you today about recognizing opportunities. Recognizing opportunities. There are moments in our lives where God sets us up, and it is our responsibility to discern the moments of, that God presents to us. What I have recognized in my walk with the Lord, and I have been guilty of it at times, is that God will intervene supernaturally, what, what I call a supernatural setup, and because we are not prepared and perceiving what he's doing, we miss opportunities that could cause us to elevate our walk and our position in the kingdom of God. Now, let's just go back to the story, and I'm going to extract from the story some, some things that I believe will help us today in recognizing opportunities. When we look at, this, at the, the, the chapter, Ahab, if you know anything about the scripture, Ahab had to be the worst king in the, the history of Israel. He was evil. And here, if it doesn't get any evil, he's married to an evil woman, all right? Now, there's nothing, you know, it, 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 I can remember we were, her name was Jezebel. So here's what you don't want to do. Don't name your daughter Jezebel, Okay. Now, and, and, and listen, I know, I know you people, I know, I know, I know a lot of, say you people, I say us, I'm gonna, we, sometimes we're out there, we think that just names sound catchy, and we just are, ooh, that's a beautiful name. No, it's not a beautiful name. 
But anyway, let's just get back to the story. Um, Tammy and I and Pastor Harvey and Pastor Leslie, when we were hit by a dump truck a number of years ago, we should have known something. We went to Bob Evans, which is a restaurant out on the East Coast, and we had breakfast. It was a good breakfast, but we were having nothing but trouble the entire morning. And then I wonder what was going on, and our waitress walked up, and I looked at her name badge, and her name was Jezebel. And I knew this was going to be a bad day. <laughs> Don't name your child Jezebel. They are considered Ahab and Jezebel, the worst kings in all of history. Yet, yet, despite all of the things, and I've wondered, and, and where this came from is as I'm reading through my Bible plan, I get, to this, I get to this king, King Ahab, and I'm like, man, this guy is evil. But then I find out here's God trying to bless him despite all of the evil things he has done. He has been nothing but a hell raiser. He souls, he pouts, his wife is weird, She's crazy, and above all that, she's a witch. Now, I could use many words there, but I'm just going to use the word witch, all right? Now, she's, she's, she's just a terrible individual. And, and yet, here's God. Listen now. Listen online. God, despite their, I wouldn't just say imperfections, their, their evil motives, God is still trying to set them up and change the seasons of their life. Now listen to me. I want you to know that no matter how bad you be, you have been, if God could set Ahab up for a change, he can set you up. All right? He can set you up for a change. And I'm believing that, that no matter how many times you have missed it, no matter how many times you've gone off the rail, you need to know that the love that our God has for you, he's always trying to set you up for a blessing. Can I get an amen from the amen corner? No, I want you to, I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that. Now, now the prophet the prophet Elijah and Ahab had gone back and forth, and I won't go into that very long. But if you read the entire book, uh, uh, the chapter of chapter 20, you'll see that things in Ahab's life begins to change. Right before this, Ahab is, con he's conferring with, with prophets of Baal. They're psychics. They're, 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 they're warlocks. They're, they're evil people. And Elijah shows up, and Elijah kills every one of his, of his evil prophets. But here's something that's going on. The Bible says that a prophet showed up because there was an invading army, Ben-Hadad, who was coming to Israel to destroy it. And God despite all of what Ahab had done, sends the word of the Lord to Ahab and he reminds him that I am with you and you will win this battle. No matter how many times you conferred with the prophets of Baal, no matter how many times you have failed in, in your evilness, I want you to know that my grace, my love is sufficient for you and I am going to send my help in the time of need. So God sends the prophet. Here's the season of change. Before he's conferring with prophets of Baal, now he's listening to the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is, Ahab, you're gonna win. You attack first. But here's what you have to do. I want you to destroy the people of Syria and I want you to destroy Ben-Hadad the king. Now they go out and they win the battle and somehow Ben Hadad, he slips away. However, the Bible says that the prophet came back and said, Ahab, I want you to know that the devil's regrouping. Here's, here's a news flash. Here's some words of encouragement. The devil may be gone now, but he's coming back. <laughs> Ooh, that helps you out in church, don't it? But anyway, 
He says, get ready, he's coming back. And remember the word of the Lord, Ahab, that when God gives them into your hand, I want you to destroy and annihilate this country, and I want you to destroy and take out this man who's the king. So what happens? They go to battle, he wins, he brings the king to him, and the Bible says that he looked upon him as a friend, that he even allowed him to ride in his chariot. Now here's what I wanna say. There are times in our lives that God is setting us up for a major change. And if we don't cooperate with God, we can miss our opportunity for God to do in our lives in one second that it would normally take 10 years if you did it on your own. I want you to know there's some opportunities, and I'm speaking prophetically today, there's some opportunities that are coming your way, and God is shifting some things in your life, but you've got to have the perception You've got to have the understanding. You've got to have the knowledge that when God begins to shift your life, Ahab, you got to do what he tells you to do because this is going to propel you into your promising future. Come on, if you believe that, give the Lord an offering of praise. But the mistake that Ahab made, he called the enemy his brother, instead of his enemy, and he makes an agreement with him. And the prophet said, as we just read, because you did not take full advantage of the opportunity, you will die. Now, there are times in our lives where God comes to shift us. And I want you to hear me today. You say, well, you know, Bishop, I know this is a great word for somebody who's watching online or somebody across, across the, 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 the sanctuary from you. I want you to know, that all of us somehow at times in God have missed opportunities. And so today I want to talk to you about some principles of how you can recognize that when God is shifting things in your life and God is drawing you closer to him, that instead of wondering what to do, you can have insight, perception, and understanding of what to do when God begins to move some things in your lives. I want to say today that there are doors that are about to be opened for you in your new season. There are doors of new adventures. People who are sitting here right now, somebody needs to hear this, that even today, today by sitting in this room, There are doors of opportunity for your life to change forever and ever and ever. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 says this, so be careful how you live. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most, say it out loud with me, make the most. most. Say it again, make the most most. of every opportunity opportunity. in these evil days. Now, what does the word opportunity mean? Now, let's go to Miriam, uh, Miriam Webster. It's a set of circumstances that makes it possible to do something. Ahab, in his own ability, could never have detached himself from his evil lifestyle. God sets him up so that he not only can remove himself from evil, but he can also win a great victory and bring future victories to the people of Israel. Do you know this today, that when you start walking in victory, you're making a way for others to walk in victory? But the tragic thing is sometimes, the tragic thing is, and I don't want to say many times, but I do want to emphasize this today, is that we always believe that another opportunity will come 
when we miss one boat. And the truth is that Ahab had his moment to jump on the ship and sail in a new direction. But God said, because you did not take advantage of this opportunity, you will pay with it for your life and your people. Your people will pay for your missed opportunity. So can I overemphasize that when God's grace begins to move in your life, that we sometimes are casual, we are, we are kind of just easy going about the ways of God and we say, you know what, if I want to get right, I can get right next week. Or if I just want to do it, I can jump on board next week. And the truth is that you can't make a decision on your own unless the grace of God has opened the door for you. And when God opens the door for you, ladies and gentlemen, we need to run through it. Come on. Now, now let me just set a little more foundation. So an opportunity is a set of circumstances that makes it possible to do something. It gives you access. It's a new door, so to say, to open you to a new place. And if you would imagine a door here today, doors open up to a new space. There's a, there's a place that is withheld from us, but until the door is open, we can't move into a new place or a new space. And what, what God is saying is that there are opportunities that are coming, that you're going to need to respond, and this new door is going to open up a new season and preparing you for the next place and the next level. Let me just give you a case in point. One of the greatest days in my wife's life was the day that she met me. I don't know why you're laughing about it. It is true. And it was likewise, okay? So it was the greatest day. But I want you to understand that there was something going on here. Now, when you're walking through it, now I'm going to give you a little background. Some of you have heard this before, so you just bear with me. But there are those online who have not heard how we met. We met in church. We met on a Sunday morning. Who knows? She may be sitting right here. Wow, nobody got too excited about that. The only person that got excited was my wife. And I understand her excitement. I do understand that. But it was a Sunday morning, and the, the, the situation had changed. The Thursday before the fr Sunday that we met, I was supposed to just lead worship in church. That's what, I'll, that's what I did. I started off playing drums, I played the bass, I played the trumpet, I played every, I, 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 I like to just play around with all the instruments, but drums were my first, my first instrument. And, and then, then, you know, so every job in the church, I, I took over because somebody quit. I have a degree in communications and film and television because the guy that mom and dad hired quit, so I had to step in. Uh, I, I stepped in to lead worship because somebody quit. Um, nobody quit the children's ministry, so I never took that over. So <laughs> I'm thankful to God that uh, that never happened. But so, but it was it was it was Thursday before Sunday, and my dad got a phone call from a church that was going through a crisis, and he was called to go and help. This church was going through a whole lot. Their pastor had just picked up and left, and it was, it was a bad, 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 bad situation. So my dad, it was in Tennessee, so dad had to leave on Thursday evening, and he, he, he called me, he said, son, and I had been preaching on Sunday night. Back in those days, church, we had church on Sunday night. Now, if you came, they were, it was always said that the people, the hypocrites came to church on Sunday morning. But the real church, how many know what I'm about Sunday, Sunday night? The real church came on Sunday night. 
And boy, we had a Holy Ghost throw down. We would sing, we'd shout, we'd praise the Lord. I mean, it was an awesome time. So I had been preaching on Sunday night. And Dad said, you know what, son? I want you this Sunday to preach in my place. My goodness, I said, on Sunday morning, all those hypocrites. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said, oh, my God, Sunday morning, this is the big show. This is the main event. This is the epic time. What do I need to do? Only thing I need to do was fast and pray a lot. I fasted and I prayed and I prayed. I'm telling you, I fasted. I, only, I went on a water-only uh, diet. I, I, I mean, uh, I mean, I fast. And so I show up to church on Sunday, not knowing that I was fasting and praying, not just for the people, but maybe I was fasting and praying for the salvation of my future wife. That Sunday was the Sunday that Tammy showed up. She showed up on a Sunday morning when I was preaching, and guess who was the first one down to give their heart to Jesus? My future wife. Now listen to me. I can go a lot of places with this because it's very funny. I get that. But I want you to just take in the principle what if, what if Bishop would have said, son, I want you to preach, but I would have taken it casual, never spent a little bit more time in the prayer closet, not spending enough time reading the word to get a word that would change not only Tammy's future, and boy, did she need a change in her future. <laughs> I needed a change in my future. What if I had not been prepared and recognized? I know she recognized the opportunity as soon as she walked in the door. That's my husband. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, how many times has God set you up How many times has God set you up because you didn't have the recognition and the discernment to see where you are and you missed your wife? Now, in my case, it was a wife, but what I'm saying is it could be a job. It could be a new, a new ministry. Oh, how about this? How about an opportunity to be delivered from something that you've been struggling with. But because you didn't respond when the Holy Spirit's grace was moving, instead of trying to work it out on your own, trying to get him right or trying to get situations right, when all you have to do is that when God begins to move the waters, learn to run and seize your opportunity. So, so opportunity gives us access. It gives us access. So let me talk about just a few things, how we can recognize. Number one, I want you to know the devil looks for opportunities. The Bible says that. Remember when Jesus was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness? And then the Bible says that the devil left him after he tempted him three times, he tempted him. And when Jesus responded with the word of God, he quoted the book of Deuteronomy. Look at chapter, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says that when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. If you think about it in your life, the devil knows how to seize on opportunities. How, do, how does the devil come after us? When we're walking in our own when we're walking in God's power, we're walking in God's strength, when we're, we're, we're doing things by the word, and we're, 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 we're living by faith, 
the devil can't mess with us, but it's those moments that we leave the door open. It's those moments that we maybe connect with a relationship that we know we should never get in. What we do is we leave the door of opportunity open, not for you, for the devil. And what does the devil do when there's an opportunity? He takes his liberty. He doesn't ask you. He doesn't, he doesn't ask for your permission. What does he do? He just comes and he barges in and he takes his place. I'm telling you, if there's anything you want to learn from the devil, learn how to take your opportunities. Learn how to seize your moment that when God opens the door, what is Ephesians 4, 27? It says, Nor, don't give any place to the devil. Because the devil is an opportunist. He looks. He looks for opportunities to seize your situation and to quench your desires for God. So the enemy learns how to exploit the moment. We need to learn how to exploit the moment that God begins to shift. He begins to open the door and he begins to push us into a new season. How many believe that today? Secondly, God opens the doors. God opens the doors of opportunities. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 12. Paul says this, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. The Lord is the one who's opening new doors of opportunity for city church, for this leadership, for your business, for your career, for your children, and you've got to say today, Lord, make me discerning of the doors that are opening in my life that I know that I know that it's you who's moving me in a new direction. Revelations chapter 3 verse 8 says this, I know your works. See, I have set before you a what? A open door. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9 says, for an effective and great door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So God speaks to Paul and says, listen, there's doors that are beginning to open. Yes, you're going to have a hard time, but just run through them anyway. Amen. Acts 16, 27, I like this door. There's nothing better than a door opening when you're in prison. And the keeper of the prison doors opened. When Paul and Silas were in jail, God sent an earthquake and opened the doors. We give the devil an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to come in and to seize our situation when we are slacking and drifting in our walk. Opportunities are like waves. They're like, like, you know, if you've never been, I know we, we go down to Florida, and Florida is a beautiful place, but Florida don't have waves. I've been to waves. I've been to the North Shore in Hawaii on the island of Oahu. My wife can tell you firsthand. We were on our honeymoon. We've got so many great stories. We wanted to go on the North Shore, and we got in our little car, and we drove over that, and she comes running out. You know, she's just cute as, as big can be. And, you know, she, she, she comes out, and, and, and we're used to, you know, Florida waves, you know. You can wade in them. No, these suckers are like 20 feet tall, but we didn't know it. And you know, she just runs out there, boom, the wave hits her, knocks her down. I'm telling her, don't come. And, she come, and it was just a disaster. I mean, we, under, we, we met the wave firsthand. But when there's a wave coming, I was watching the surfers out there. When I was watching the surfers, I realized once one thing. They could not make their own wave. They had to wait on the wave. And you have, you have to be that way in God. Many times we want to try to create our own wave. 
It's called strange fire. It's called weirdness. But when you're walking with God, all you have to do is get on your surfboard, lay in the water, and wait for the wave to come. But when the wave comes, don't let somebody else take your wave. I watched the, I watched the surfers are out there. They weren't going to let anybody take their wave. This is my space. This is my moment. This is my opportunity. God sent it my way. And when that wave begins to roll, brother, they just pushed their board up and got up on it. And they rolled the wave as far as it would take them. You're not responsible, ladies and gentlemen, to make the wave. God makes the wave of opportunity. But you've got to get up on your board and you've got to learn how to seize the way. I can remember when the opportunity came for us to purchase this building. I did not want this building. I didn't want this building. I didn't want this place. I didn't think we needed it. But the opportunity was presented to us. I didn't go and chase it. Tammy and I were buying a car, and there was a lady in there. She said, you're going to buy this old, this church. Like, we're not buying a church, lady. We're here to buy a Lexus. He said, you're going to buy this church, and you're going to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And we're like, we're not even wanting it. See what I'm saying? That when you're walking with God, he creates the waves of opportunity. But many times in our lives, we miss the opportunity thinking that it's going to come again. And the truth is, when the wave comes, we're not guaranteed that another one will replace it. We were presented, we purchased it, and we seized the opportunity. Opportunities are like a door. It opens up to a new space. The door keeps me from the other room. But when God opens the door that no man can shut, it's not enough. It's not enough that God opens the door. Y'all want God to open the door and then pick you up and bring you through the door. That's what we do. We want God to do everything. God open the door. Pick me up, take me through, kiss me, give me a bottle, do everything you've got to do, God, because you know, I'm your child. No, you're my child, but I'm presenting a door, but you got to run through it. You've got to take hold of it and say, today I see an opportunity and I'm not gonna let it pass me by. It may be leadership. God's calling you to leadership. God's calling you to open a business. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. Hallelujah. Thirdly, doors are only open for a short time. Doors are closed in your house most of the time. If you look at a door, I'm looking at the doors all around here, 17 doors. The doors are closed. Doors are usually closed in your life. Opportunities are usually, they come few and far between. But we mistakenly believe that the door, when God opens it, will still be open tomorrow. Think about it, the doors of Noah were open for seven days. And when the doors closed, it didn't matter who was banging on the door after it was closed. Nobody was let in but the eight. The only ones that were in were the animals who responded. All of the other animals that did not respond, when the door was shut, it was finished. God says in Matthew chapter 25 that the five wise and the five foolish virgins, that when the door was open, God said walk through, but when the door closed, 
The five foolish virgins were not allowed in. Why? Because the opportunity for God to deliver them, the opportunity for God to push them into a new a space, a new season. Once that moment comes and that door is shut, that door can never be opened again. So today the Lord is calling you and I today to what may not be open now, but when that door does open, are you ready to respond? Are you willing to respond? And the last thing I've learned about doors and opportunities is that when the doors aren't open, sometimes we have to learn to knock. Matthew 7 verse 7 says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and it shall find, but knock, knock. If you're struggling today with opportunities and you don't understand what to do, don't stop knocking. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Woo! And every rock and roller in this house responded greatly to that. You keep knocking. So the keys to knocking is preparation. Keys of preparation opens the door. Not every opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this as a little warning before we close. Not every opportunity comes from God. Now, how do we recognize when it's not from God? Opportunities, I said, are not only like a wave, but they're also like a door. When you walk through a door and you have to bend or compromise when you go through the door, it's not God's opportunity. Somebody says, you know, I'm always on people who flirt to convert. I'm going to go to the club and I'm going to make, I'm going to win him. I'm going to win her. I'm going to, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, no, no, no. Anytime, anytime, listen to me, listen to me online. Anytime you're compromising or you're having to adjust your lifestyle to fit some other opportunity, it's not an opportunity from God. Are you listening today? If you have to compromise, don't walk through that door. Because that door is not from God. And lastly, wasted opportunity is tragic. Luke 19 verse 44 says, this is Jesus saying, and you level you and your children with you to the ground. This is the Romans will come. And he says, they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Luke 13, verse 25 says, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand and knock at the door saying, open for us, and he will say, I did not know you. Proverbs 10, verse 5, he who sleeps in a harvest, this is the second part, he who sleeps in the harvest is a son who causes shame. Now listen to this today. Isaiah 55, verse 6, it's something that's always seared in my heart. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. When I read that verse, it gives me the connotation or the understanding that there are times when he is not near and there are times that he cannot be found. You can't just come to the Lord when you want to. It's only when he opens the door or can we say it this way, he gives me the opportunity. My opportunity to come to the Lord was March 21, 1981. I was one of only about five people in the whole room. 
And when the preacher gave the call for somebody to give their heart to the Lord, I had such a burning in my heart. I had such a stirring inside of me. I didn't even bother to look around if the other four were going to get up and go down. I mean, how easy it is for us sometimes to get saved amongst hundreds, but to get saved amongst five. But I wasn't worried about everybody else because I knew. I couldn't put it into words at the time, but I knew this was my moment. I can go on and on and on about the moments in my life where I know that God was stirring the water, that God was opening the door, where God was shifting things around. And I can tell you, sometimes I have missed it, but there's been many times I know through God's grace that I have seized the moments. And I'm just speaking prophetically today that the greatest missed opportunity that Ahab had was to destroy the enemy in his life. There are times where God will stir the waters because he wants to deliver you from where you are. He wants to move you to another location. He wants to move you to another space. He wants to move you to another place. But we're not recognizing the opportunity, so therefore we miss the chance for God to destroy your enemy like he wanted to do for Ahab. The greatest missed opportunity is to know Christ and to miss his opportunity for salvation. The second greatest opportunity to miss is to have the chance to work for Jesus and to hear him say, well done, and we just pass it off. Hebrews 3.15 says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. Let me ask you this as I'm closing the third and the final time. What opportunity has God given you, but you keep ignoring it? What talents has God given you and you refuse to use it for his glory? What area of your life are you ignoring? What ministry has God opened for you that you have not fully stepped into it yet? What promise has God made to you, but you refuse to claim it? What resources has God provided, but you have not used it for his glory? Where have you allowed fear to prevent you from following God's plan? What area of your character is God refining, but you keep resisting? What opportunity for growth are you ignoring? Have you become so complacent in your walk with God that you don't hear him say, let's move to the next place? Where has God called you to step out, yet you keep on hesitating? What opportunity has God given you to be a witness to someone, and yet you never stepped out? What commandment are you willfully disobeying? What way are you allowing the world's distractions to pull you away from God's best? Don't let it slip away from you today. There was a guy in our church when I was a kid. I've, I guess I was about maybe nine or ten. He was in a terrible petroleum blast. It was a terrible, horrible, tragic event. His brother was killed in this tank, and he was blown up, charred from head to toe. He was dying, and my dad walked in and said, Son, will you give your heart to the Lord? I believe if I pray for you, God's going to raise you up. He was in the emergency room. He was dead. He was charred. Told my dad, he said, Bishop... I'll, I'll give God everything. Dad prayed for him. He was supposed to die. As dad walked out, he kind of came to life. God gave him back his life. He had new skin. They couldn't believe how it had all grown back. It was in a blast. It was third degree burns, head to toe. 
If you've seen him afterwards, he looked like he was a newborn child with new skin. His settlement came up. He was the first person in Louisiana to ever get a million dollars for any kind of catastrophe. He asked me today, he said, he said Bishop, he said, if, he said, if God will just continue to use me and bring me out of here, whatever I get from God, I'm going to give God the tithe. Bishop continued to pray for him, put him on TV, put his name all over the place. He was known. He was just moving along. But then the money came. Then the money came. The opportunity. (laughs) The opportunity came. He took the opportunity and chartered a plane to Hawaii and took all of his friends that didn't come to the church. Didn't take me. (laughs) We never heard from him after the chartered flight until about two years later. I was on the phone and the phone rang at two o'clock in the morning. Don't ask me why I was on the phone at two o'clock in the morning. None of your business. (laughs) Picked up the phone. Said, Owen, this is Steve. It's not his name. This is Steve. So yeah, what's going on, man? I need to talk to Bishop. I said, "Uh, what's wrong, man? He says, I'm in jail. I'm in jail. So what you in, you're in jail for what? Because it's a long story. It's a long story. But man, I'm, I'm broke. I'm broke. I'm in jail. And I missed my opportunity. I didn't do what I told God I would do. Dad took it from there. But that story as a 10-year-old kid has stuck out in my mind, Pastor Harvey. He had an opportunity not only to be a wealthy man, that's one thing, wealth comes and goes, but more importantly, he had an opportunity to be a blessing to so many people. And yet not only did he pay like Ahab, but how many people has he let down that he could have reached if he would have responded to God with the opportunity that God presented for him, not only to save his life in this world, but to save his life in the next life, which is eternity. I wonder how many people did, hey, God is moving on you and you know that relationship is not right, but you're missing the opportunity and you're going on thinking I'll be able to get out of this. And you won't be able to get out of it unless God opens the door. Unless God shifts the situation, Ahab. You were a wicked king for many years, Ahab. But God's grace is still saying, there's an opportunity to not only get out, but to destroy the enemy that's come after you. You don't understand. There are enemies that you are going to destroy when you respond to move to the next level. Come on, stand with me.